Peter Durrant, Sarah's husband. Um, my father had a job um, operating lifts in the city of London. My mother never worked. Um, no one had any qualifications. I had three brothers and one sister. My sister's died and one of my brothers has died. A family living on a council estate and uh, left school at 14 and all, all the usual things. We saw a job in the Evening Standard, <laughs> which was about a penny then. And my father came with me to the interview to 37 Mincing Lane, which is where the tea brokers reside. And I got a job as a, a messenger boy um, at three pounds, 10 and sixpence a week. And I stood there for f f three or four years until I did my national service. It's very good. It was a bit rough and a bit tough, but you met lots. It was a growing up experience. And so you had to learn to stand on your own feet. So it wasn't bad. Looking back, I've got lots of fond memories of it. Well, I was a teleprinter operator. That's the nice thing about it. It taught you a trade. Um, so I went to work for the post office in London. And then I worked for um, Cable and Wireless. Um, and then I went to New Battle Abbey in Scotland, which is a, a, a second chance college where you spend a year doing academic things. But then I got into Bromley College um, of um, further education and did a diploma in social work. And that got me a job in social work. Um, where did I get a job? Oh, yes, in Hammersmith Mental Health Department, would you believe? Um, and there were only five people in the department at that time in Hammersmith. And I stayed there for three years. Um, but good years there. Um, we were living in Kingston at the time. Sarah and I had married by that time. Oh, we met at, um, in London um, at um, a lecture, which was advertised in New Society, on um, transgenderism. And we went to this meeting organised by some sort of radical group. Um, and we met there, but that was in the early days. I mean, nobody was talking about tra um, transgenderism in those days, and this was the 70s. But there were some exciting things happening in the 70s, of course. Um, and then three years later, I went to, to Bristol. And then I got a job teaching in, at the, which is now the East of England University. And uh, so then I came, then I came to, where did I come to? Gosh, Cambridge. Um, that was, God knows how many years ago. I was 20 years in Cambridge until I had the car accident in um, 1985. We were in a police car and this guy, um, we were doing a section three admission under the 1983 Mental Health Act. And I, 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 all, all I can remember about that Saturday morning was that um, I was on duty and I went to this basement flat somewhere in Cambridge. And the GP came along and together we put in the sanctions. And when we were going to formal, um, the guy grabbed the will, and he didn't do it because he was wicked or evil. And I've always found this terribly useful, actually, that um, neither Sarah or I, by f virtue of the fact, I hope, that we're into... I'm a determinist in the sense I don't believe in free will. That people don't behave, don't produce dreadful actions or, or painful incidents for other people because they do it because they can't cope at that point in time. Now, it seems to me so obvious, I can't understand the concept of wickedness and evil. Um, Sarah, um, she spent her life bringing up the kids, in fact, in the early life, and um, then started to look at, realise there was nothing going for people with various forms of um, head injury, now brain injury, you call it, don't you? Um, and she never used me as, a, as some example, but she did it because of me. So there was nowhere to go, but I, there was a very good psychologist at the, um, at the hospital. I'm, um, and I can't remember his name either, but he was, he was really good and sort of, um, after I came out of the coma, he was, um, I didn't know if I was coming or going. When we left the hospital, I didn't know where I lived. Um, a common problem, I'm sure, for many people you meet here. Um, but we got home and, um, I was, although I was working for the social work department, I didn't work again for six months. But he was terribly good at sort of getting me back into a post-head injury state of mind. But although they took me back for two or three years, I never worked as a social worker again. They put me in Shire Hall. But what we did then was create a number of um, social enterprises 
uh, before they said, uh, when I was in my early 50s, clear off. They may be redundant, in other words. Um, but Sarah, all of this time, was beginning to pick up her posts, bringing up children view of the world. And so she went to, to um, um, the Anglia and qualified in three years, I think, as a social worker. Well, she had a word with this nice psychologist um, and they looked around, the pair of them, um, for... Oh, she got talking to Headway in London and all the rest of it and picked up the notion of what a day centre was, working with people with head injuries. And then down at the bottom of Mill Road, um, she or this guy, whatever his name was, found um, your old home, of course, and which was completely derelict. And she and I and other people used to slap some paint about. And, uh, and, and gradually, uh, oh, she got, and it was on, on, she got it on a token payment. Um, and they gradually, be headway began to gradually become shaping, sh achieve a sort of um, um, reputation at that time. Um, and gradually, so people started to refer to her. And Morris would have been part of that, but he was also so self-effacing. Without Morris, it would never have happened because he was such a, an outgoing, generous, unselfish guy that he gave all of his professional skills as an accountant and as a supporter. That was in 86 or 87, so I don't recall it too much. I, I used to stay away from it for some reason because when I enjoyed seeing her doing it for herself, it, it was her, her becoming, getting away from mo motherhood can become awfully um, encompassing. And um, she began to evolve as a person in her own right. But Sarah's natural approach, and, and so was Morris's, was to have people as equal partners all of the time. And that was great. So she got something which the professional groups still haven't realised you must do. And let's get away from the absurdity of thinking it's us and them, uh, as opposed to problem solving together.